Yeah, exactly. So like, what people do is that, imagine you want to save the animals, but you're never going to have to actually pay the amount of money that it takes to save them. Well, you could say, I'm willing to pay $200 billion to save the animals. Right? Because you know that'll get the survey guy to say, oh shit, we should really save the animals, right? And given that you never have to pay the money, you know, it's no skin off your nose, right? So, uh, on the other hand, if you think that the animals are totally stupid, you just say, look, I'm not willing to pay anything to save them, even if you were willing to pay a little bit, because you want to convince them not to save the animals. So, to the extent that this actually is used for anything, which it maybe isn't that much, but to the extent that it is, people are going to have to completely the wrong incentives. They're going to never be honest. They're just going to go to the most extreme thing they can say for whatever uh, the thing, the um, position that they have is. So people are never going to have an incentive to repeal tr truthfully their willingness to pay in this case. Yeah, sure. Well, the problem is the payment just gets you to take the survey, but it doesn't change what you report within the survey, right? Am I? Am I? Yeah. What if you okay. um, gave the survey um, both ways? For example, you yeah. gave it one saying that, oh, we're going to knock down this building, and give it another time saying, oh, we're going to preserve this building. You can take an average of both. Does that help? Well, there, there's a lot more ways than you can manipulate it than that. So people have figured out, like, all sorts of subtle manipulations. They're like, there's a hundred buildings in the city. We're going to knock down this one. There's a thousand buildings in the country. We're going to knock down this one. You'll get literally like an order of magnitude bigger thing. If you, or you could say there's ten uh, buildings in the neighborhood. We're going to knock down this one. When you put the neighborhood, they'll say they're willing to pay a lot. When you say the city, they'll say live less. And when you say the country, they'll say even less. I mean, so you can get it, people to give any number you want them to give, basically. Except when it has a real impact on policy. In which case, they report incredibly extreme stuff. And the point is, if this thing doesn't have a real impact on policy, why are we wasting our money giving the survey anyway, right? So the whole thing sort of makes no sense. Uh, so uh, one of my favorite examples of this came from The um, Economist. So the Economist reporter went down to Haiti. And he surveyed a bunch of people about whether they were getting aid from like the US and so forth. And everyone said, no, nope, we're not getting anything. Uh, you know, we, we haven't received any supplies. He then followed them and he saw that their houses were like filled with supplies that like said the UN on them. And then he said, why did you lie to me? And they said, well, you know, if people find out that we're getting supplies, they're not going to send anymore. Right? <laughs> so, so as long as people have incentives, they're not going to report truthfully. Yeah, Ben? I wonder if this might be a little bit of a tangent, but like the, yeah. the political polling, which yeah. is saying truths, or like if those same things are true about like, surveys and like whether... I guess the economist doesn't trust polls or things that they're like, like people are, like what are their incentives? In like well, the thing poll? that's a little bit, so there, there's something that's a little bit better about a poll, which is that a poll is binary. So you can't like exaggerate how much you care about something in a poll. You know what I mean? You can just say like, am I in favor or am I against well, the like, thing? Like who, like, like the Republican Party, like they're like, there are more than two candidates, right? So like, yeah, but, but again, it's, it's not like people are going to exaggerate something in that. Like they're going to, People are going to have an incentive to say, I mean, if, assuming that the person who gets the most votes in the poll, like, does the best in the election, people are always going to be truthful on those things. You know what I mean? But when you ask people how much they're willing to pay, then you open it up to, like, a lot more problems than the polling does. But even the polling can be incredibly bad when it comes to stuff that people aren't, like, really used to voting on. So, like, polls for referendums are notoriously terrible. I would say that they have, like, a... 52% like uh, chance of predicting the correct thing. So like in California, they had this whole like legalized marijuana initiative. And the polls like consistently were showing like 65% of people supporting it. And then the election came around and 20% voted in favor of it. So it was like, I guess people sort of felt good about themselves to think they were a liberal person, you know, supporting, but in the end they didn't really want it. Or what, who knows what their motivation was, but it, it didn't work very well, so. And, and people like never, have to vote on this sort of stuff. So, you know, at least the polls, they have some experience voting on this stuff. These things are just like, come completely out of the blue from some, you know, hippie guy who's coming around with a, you know, white, you know, a, a clipboard and a piece of paper, right? So, um, okay. So, the point that I was trying to make 
is that if we actually want to take seriously the problem of figuring out how we can get this information out of people, we need to think more seriously about what they have an incentive to say and what they have an incentive not to say, right? And let's, let's put a little bit of a mo model on this. So imagine that the private benefits of an activity are B of Q, and we want to determine the socially optimal amount. Now, if there were no externalities, that would be just to set B prime equal to zero, but there might be some externalities associated with this thing. Now, imagine each individual knows the harm that is created for him or her, and the total harm created is just the sum of the harms to all the individuals, and so the optimal level of Q is going to maximize the difference between uh, the benefits and the harms, right? And so the question is, how can we get us, people to tell us the truth about the harms? Now, one way to think about this is just to push the problem back one layer, which is to say, if I report a particular value of my harm, um, that's really an action that I'm taking. Because that is going to influence how much of the activity is going to occur. And so <coughs> you can make me pay the externalities that are caused by my saying I'm harmed by something you're doing. right? If I pay all the externalities, then I'll have an incentive to tell the truth. Just as if I pay the externalities, I have an incentive to do the action that's in society's best interest. So the question is, what are the externalities created by my reporting some particular value h hat rather than h, uh, that I have no harm? Um, well, imagine I reported I wasn't harmed at all. What would happen? We would maximize the difference between the benefits and the costs to everyone other than me, right? That would be the social optimum if I said that I wasn't harmed by the activity. Right? Um, and we could call the optimum, in this case, Q star sub negative i. Because negative i means it doesn't include me. I'm guy i. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if I report h hat, then what they're going to do is maximize the difference between the benefits, the cost to everyone else, and the cost to me, which I said was h hat, right? And let's call the optimal under that q star hat. The externality that I then cause is the difference between um, what everybody else, other than me, including the benefits and the cost to other people, would get in the case when we had q star sub negative i, and in the case when we had q star hat. Right? So the externality that I cause, let me give a graphical example of this. So imagine this is the benefit. That's the harm to everyone else. If I report a harm to me that's like that, then we would add these up horizontally to figure out the optimum. Maybe it would be something like that. This would be what the outcome was without me. Sorry, this is the outcome without me. This is the outcome with me. And the harm to everybody else from moving here from here is that Harberger triangle. Right? Because that's the difference between everybody else's uh, harm and everybody else's benefit that's caused by me reporting what I report. Right? So that's what I'm forced to pay. Um, okay, so the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism asks that people, whenever they make a report of how much they're harmed by something, have to pay that Harberger triangle, that dead weight loss triangle. So here's the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism. Everyone reports the harm to them. Um, a cap on the amount of the activity is set at Q star, maximizing the difference between the benefits and the harms. And then every individual pays the difference, the amount of harm 
cause to everyone other than themselves as a result of them reporting what they did rather than reporting zero. That's the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism. And then, if you want, you can have people receive or make some payment, which doesn't depend on what they say. But, but that's sort of unrelated. So there are two really important things to note about this. First, is that an individual doesn't need to report the full harm that they cause. They could just report any piece of information they have. So, for example, I could say, look, I don't know how much the hurricane is going to hurt my house. But I do know that if I lost my house, here's how much it's worth to me. Right? Now that will give us a big calculation of a climate model and so forth and influence something. And um, that uh, they'll have the true, right incentives to report truthfully on that, even if they don't know all the information. So one nice thing about that is that people <coughs> only need to tell you what, they, what it is that they know. They don't need to tell you, they don't need to know the whole thing. Um, and the second thing is that externalities, when I make my payments into this mechanism, that dead weight loss triangle, that money cannot go to the people who got hurt by what I did. It has to go to the government or to someone who's completely uninvolved with this situation. The reason is, if it went to the other people who are hurt by this, then everyone would have an incentive to say, oh, I'm going to be really hurt if he reports this. Because then I'm going to expect that he's going to report that and I'll get a bunch of money. So it destroys the incentive properties. If other people get the money that you pay for the harm that you do to them. Um, and we're going to see that that's going to cause some really big problems. Okay. So the most common practical application of the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism is what's called the second price auction. And, and Federico, could you describe what, what the second price auction is? Was that, was that the right. it, it was in the variant. Oh, right, yeah. right. Um, so you have the auction, um, and the person who wins only has to pay what the previous bid was? So yeah, the that's exactly right. That's the second price auction. So he doesn't pay what he bid, he pays what the, set, the person who just lost the auction bid. Um, and notice that this is, in some sense, his externality, right? Because if he hadn't bid, then the other guy would have gotten it, and the other guy uh, valued it at that much, so your externality from having bid is the price that the other guy would have paid. So that's, uh, that's the reason that the second price auction is an example of the Vickery Clark Grove mechanism. Yeah, Clementina. But couldn't you like, make a very high bid, and then the other person would have bid again, but you just would have to bid what the other person did? So if like, somebody bid 10, you yeah. could bid then like, 100, but then the other person would have bid again, because Exactly. That's exactly how it works. Yeah, but like, wouldn't that just create an incentive to bid very high, but then have to pay a lot? No. So let's go through the logic of it. Okay. So condition. So first thing I wanted to state, and now I'll try to show you why it's the case, is that um, everyone has an incentive to report their true value for the thing. Unlike what Clementino was saying, but it's a good question. And the reason is. Conditional on your winning or losing, how much you pay has nothing to do with what you bid. So you only want to make sure that you win and lose in the right cases, not that you bid the right amount given that you're winning or losing. So that's the first thing to notice. And the second thing is you never want to win at a price above what you're willing to pay, and you never want to lose at a price below what you're willing to pay. Why is that? Um, well, imagine you bid lower than what you're willing to pay. And, but there's someone who beats you, who's between what you're willing to pay and that number. Well, then you could have beat that person and you would have been better <coughs> off. Right? On the other hand, imagine that you bid higher and you end up winning at a price above what you're willing to pay. 